says he would have fed them also with the finest wheat and with honey from the rock. I would have satisfied you. Jesus is our rock. And not only is he our rock, but he also feeds us with the finest honey from the rock. And that's our salvation. We're going to sing honey in the rock this morning. <coughs>
you, Lamb of God, Lamb without blemish. Father, we glorify you. We thank you for the blood of Jesus on our lives. We praise your holy name to, today, God. And as we delve into your word, Spirit of God, I pray that you would touch our hearts and lead us in your ways. Open our hearts to receive. Open our ears to listen. Spirit of God, I pray you speak to us even today. Your word is anointed. Apply it to our hearts. God, speak to us today. We love you, God. We praise you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You see it as Children's Church in their preschool. Or this is this great to be a part of a church that actually prays for one another. Mm -hmm. I want to encourage you, if you're in need of prayer, you're welcome to come before the leadership at this church and, and we'll pray for you. But you know what's so great is you can grab any brother or sister and say, hey, would you, would you just pray for me? And, and that's the body of Christ. I encourage you to do that. That's a gift. That's a gift of healing that God has there for us yes. to enjoy. And I'm afraid that we just sometimes get so defeated and we just need to cry out for our holy God. For healing. So uh, just thank you. Thank you for those prayers and for his anointing. If you'd like to turn your scripture to Romans chapter 2, verses 17 through 29. As we go to the Romans road and go and continue our series through Romans, Romans 2, uh, 17 through 29. Now, we're going to read this scripture, and at first reading, it can seem kind of tough for us because. Not maybe, many of us may not be Jews, or even understand the Jewish culture. So at first reading, uh, I want you to just pray that God brings revelation as, we, as he brings this passage to life in our hearts. So as we read the scripture, verse 17 of chapter 2, we're going to be talking about even rotten to the core. <laughs> you ever know anyone, and don't point at anybody, that is rotten to the core? I mean, it comes through your mind, it's like, man, you know. So we'll be talking a bit about that, even through this scripture that God has put before us. Verse 17 of chapter 2. Indeed, you are called a Jew, and rest the law on the law, and make your boast in God, and know his will, and approve the things that are excellent. Being instructed out of the law, and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind. 
a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. You, therefore, who teach another, you do not teach yourself. You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say, do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor, abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who make a boast in the law, do you dishonor God through the breaking of the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as it is written, Verse 25, for circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. <clears throat> but if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? Question. And will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you who, even with your written code and circumcision, are a transgressor of the law? For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward to flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision <clears throat> is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Now you can see already how we may struggle with this a reading, because not coming from a Jewish background, we don't totally understand their culture. It starts off, this is really a third section of the of book of this chapter of Romans. And in this chapter, he's actually, actually starting off asking the question this. Are the Jews to whom the law was given also lost? Are the Jews, are they also lost if they're apart from Christ? Yes, apart from Christ, they are lost too. But that's not the way they thought. Many Jews felt that they were immune from God's judgment because they were Jew. I'm a Jew, so hey, I'm immune from God's judgment, you lowly lowlife. <laughs> Did I get your attention? They thought that God would never send them to hell because they were Jews. They viewed the Gentiles as fuel for the flames. Isn't that sad? Uh, all the while, under certain circumstances, Gentiles may be closer to God than the Jews because they weren't the people of the law but they were actually living closer to the law than the Jews themselves. See, the Jews get all caught up in privilege and pride. The Jewish privilege. They bore the name of the Jew and thus was a member of God's chosen people. I'm a Jew, you lowly person. I'm God's chosen. Now maybe some of you are, have siblings in your family and maybe you thought you were the favored child. If you were that, I'm the favored child. No, yeah. But sometimes that's the way we think. And, and you may, throughout Scripture, even we see even Joseph, whom God blessed, and the other ten of his brothers uh, resented him, thinking he's the favored one. Well, it wasn't necessarily Joseph's attitude, it was a calling on his life, that they resented. But with the Jew, they actually thought of themselves as better than other people. They were privileged. They were privileged. <clears throat> the Jew glorified in God and the only true God who had entered into a unique covenant relationship with the nation of Israel. Let me ask you a question. Why did God choose the Jews as his chosen people? Was it their good looks? Was it because their actions were better than anyone else at the time he chose them? Or was it that he just wanted to separate a people to be his people? Because you see, mankind had fallen. Even clear back to Adam and Eve, right? They had fallen. 
And now they have fallen into the, to sin, and sin owns the world, if you will. And God chose a people to segregate, to show his holiness, to show that they can live for God. He gave them the law. We know of the Ten Commandments and also the other law the, that they practice daily. He gave it to them to separate them so that the world could see holiness through his people. But as is common to man, they became arrogant and prideful in that separation. The Jewish pride. Jewish pride. You know, I looked up even to find a slide about Jewish pride, and you can imagine with the word pride what all came up. Uh, yeah. Isn't that unfortunate? Yeah. It was unfortunate. But the reality is they were so full of themselves. They were prideful. After all, he bore the name of a Jew and thus was a member of God's chosen people. He became arrogant in it. Um, he prided himself on being a guide to the morally and spiritually blind. A light to those who are in spiritual darkness. You know, it's like he's so arrogant in that he's looking down on the world and thinking, I'm better than you, you poor heathen. Isn't that terrible? I bet so you're walking in the filth of darkness, but I am enlightened. That was kind of their attitude. That's the mindset going on here. Even their they had a high talk and a low walk. They had a high talk. They could talk it really big. But when the world, the Gentiles specifically, would look at them, they go like, You talk so high and mighty and spiritual and claim to be chosen, but look at your life. Look at what you're doing. And see, when the world looked at them, they judged God by those who profess to be followers. Think about it. So they would say, the world, the Gentiles, the world of be, they would look at the Jews who thought they were so spiritual, and they would not only judge them, but they would judge their creator. Have you thought about that? Even we as a church that when the world sees us, we are Christians, Christ's life. So we are to be ambassadors in this world. And the world looks at us, not only calling us hypocrites, but unfortunately, they also look at our God. They look at our God. We are a reflection of our God. So they were looking at the Jews and saying, you claim all that, but I want nothing to do with that. Have you heard that in today's world? An apple can be very delightful. How many of you like apples? This one looks very crisp. I liked it. I pulled it up and thought, man, that, that looks good. Doesn't it? But you know, a, a, look, a good looking apple, and maybe you have your favorite brand that you like to bite into. Maybe it's extra sweet or you like a little more tart or whatever. But you like it certain ways. I dare say you probably have found a brand that you like. And just to think about a good apple, it looks very, right now you're wanting an apple, it sounds, looks pretty good. But what about this? What about this? I mean, you bite into the apple and look what you find. Mind you, at least it's a whole worm, not an apple. You get the picture. You get the picture. <laughs> <laughs> Getting ahead of myself. It's a whole worm. At least I because man, you think about this great apple that looked great on the outside, but when you got to the core, you didn't continue eating it, did you? I mean, it was rotten to the core. It was rotten inside. You know, I have before me. How many of you like bananas? You like bananas? And you go in and you you go through. The store, and you select certain types. How many of you like them just a little bit green? How many of you like them a little bit more well done? How many of you like them when they're overdone? Banana bread. Banana bread, yeah. Seems <laughs> squishy to hold. So, uh, Dakota, you want to come here and eat this banana for me? No, you probably would. <laughs> that's okay, thank you. Wow, that's gross. I, 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 would, I was thinking about passing it back so you can fill it, but I think it would be messy or so bad. It's amazing that something that looks so good can turn so bad. 
right? I mean, and I thought about this, and please get this in mind, I thought about getting a banana and getting it downright rotten, and then putting somehow a very appealing peeling on the outside of it, putting it back in there. And then have someone like the code to go for it, hey, peel this banana and see what you think. And say, oh, that looks good. And yuck, it's dark, dirty, yucky. It's yeah. good. You wouldn't eat it. It looked good on the outside if I did that. But the inside, you'd find it repulsive. That's what self-righteousness is like. When people look at the Jews, specifically, I won't put this down because it's starting to ooze in my hands. <laughs> Bananas on sale for $5.99, right here. <laughs> so, my friend, here's the thing as Christians. When they look at us, we can look the part, talk the part, but what do we look like on the inside? Right? That is what's going to determine what they think of us. It's just like finding the worm in an apple. It's like it makes the whole apple bad. And my friend, if we are hypocritical, just like the Jews were, then that's what the world thinks of us. In this scripture, it talks about circumcision. And I found this, actually made this, I made this slide. And I thought, that baby can really relate to what we're talking about here. Circumcision. The right of circumcision. The Jewish prided, Jews prided themselves in the right of circumcision. So what is circumcision? It's a minor surgical procedure or operation performed on the foreskin of a Jewish man. And why? God instituted circumcision because it expressed the separation of his people from the people of the world. He wanted them to be separate, set apart. And he instituted circumcision in the Jewish males. It's going to be off this picture. <laughs> And express the separation of a people to God from the world. Now, when you think of the Jews, we know we can relate to that separation. They had circumcision, and that's why they look down on the Gentiles who are uncircumcised. Because we're separated. Did you know, even today, God expects his church to be separate from the world? Yes. We, we don't talk a lot about that. About holiness. And we sang about holy. Holy. And in Isaiah chapter uh, 6, you read about that. And Isaiah said, I was undone. In other words, in the presence of God, I realized I'm not holy. I'm not worthy. But then when you read about Jesus, you start celebrating. Because he paid the price for me. Yeah. He, he yeah. made me holy. Yes. He, he brought me before the presence of God and I can bleed and cry out the blood of Jesus Christ and he says, come on in. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. See, circumcision meant to separate us and we too are to be separate from the world. A circumcised Jew who transgresses the law might as well be uncircumcised is what the scripture says. In other words, you claim separation. You claim you're better than everyone else. But the reality is the uncircumcised Gentiles were actually living better, closer to the law than you are. Is it your talk that's going to save you? Or is it going to be your walk? Is it going to be what, you know, rituals and, and religious activity that we do that's going to save us? Or is it going to be the actual circumcision of the heart? See, circumcision spiritually signified death to the flesh or putting aside evil, corrupt, unregenerate nature of man. That's what circumcision symbolized. Putting the flesh behind and walking in the spirit. So how does this compare to us today? Well, actually, Scripture in Colossians 2, and you can turn it if you like. I love the Scripture. I love to spend a lot of time here. But for a few moments, in Colossians chapter 2, verse 11, it says this. Colossians 2, 11. In Him, speaking of Christ, you are also circumcised, speaking to us, you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. 
by putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all, all your trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. We are triumphant people. And we see here, there's a comparison. Just as circumcision speaks of death to the flesh, even so, baptism speaks of burial of the old man. So, think with me. What circumcision was to the Jew equates to what baptism is to the believer today. Let that soak in. So, if circumcision equated to the dying of the flesh, baptism equates to the dying of our flesh. Romans 6, 1, uh, uh, what must we abide in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. And it goes on through that chapter saying, for, for we who died to sin, why do you live in it any longer? You can almost see that same scripture written to the Jew who was circumcised, couldn't you? Why do you abide in sin? You, you are circumcised. And this is really what the scripture is saying. You claim the circumcision. You claim the baptism. But your walk doesn't jive with it. You're not living holy. You're not living right. This is what we just read. And I thought I'd put it. We're very visual minded people. We see it again. In him you were circumcised with the circumcision not performed by hands. Speaking to us, we were circumcised with the circumcision that's not done by hands. Not the physical ritual. Your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. Circumcised by Christ. Having been buried with Him in baptism in which you also were raised with Him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Why do we burial baptize? Why do we have people dumped in water? Is it just for ritual? Or is it really a form of what the circumcision was to the Jew? Baptism is to us. It is symbolically, of the, just like the circumcision was denying the flesh, getting rid of the flesh, is baptism is to us a dying to the flesh, dying to the old. And you're symbolically saying, I am his. My old man is gone. I've been set free. I'm reenacting the death, burial, and resurrection. That's what baptism is about. We were made alive. We were made alive. Now, we can go into a deeper study, but the time will allow me. But even in Romans 4. It talks about Abraham in Romans 4, verses 1 through 4. It says in that scripture, when was Abraham a Jew? Was it when he was circumcised? For no, it says that he became a Jew when he became one inwardly before he was circumcised. Isn't that interesting? See, the circumcision to Abraham was a confirmation of who he really was. Symbol, symbolism. But he was a Jew before. That's in Romans 1. Romans 4, verses 1 through 4. Wait a minute. So, if circumcision equates to baptism to us, when would we be a Christian? When we were baptized? Or were we a Christian before we were baptized? When we gave our heart to the Lord. When we gave our life to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We say, I need the blood of Jesus Christ. I confess my sins. 
forgive me of my sin. And it says that he will come into our heart, the scripture says, that we are his. We are born again, John 3. Born from above, a supernatural experience. Romans 1, 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation. Yes. Not my rituals yes. or not my acts of what we go through. And so often in religion today, and I'm going to cover more of this next week, but in religion today, people will come to the houses to worship, and they go through religious rituals and activities and leave and don't even know the person behind it. How unfortunate. It's almost like getting dumped in baptism, or even some would practice sprinkling, what good is that if you don't know the Savior behind it? Right. What good is it? What good is it claiming to be a Jew and so righteous because of your circumcision when you are, you're not even living what you're preaching? That's hypocrisy. And that's what's been plaguing the church even today. You know, I, so I uh, sometimes work at the funeral home help out. I just did yesterday. And I see many things. And you think, oh, Lisa's saying, no more funeral stories, okay? No more, no, no. <laughs> but I view people. I look at people. I've heard a lot of funeral messages. And what's sad is, just yesterday, in the obit, the person says they were a Baptist. They hadn't practiced anything for a long time that I remember about. Go with me. This is just... In the funeral, there was a granddaughter that was overwhelmed. And she literally ran out just crying. Oh. And she went into that room and saw another relative went with her. And I, I wanted to, <clears throat> to minister to her. I really did. <clears throat> And, and maybe I should have, I just didn't feel, because there was no Jesus in the equation. And you think about that, to lose a relative that didn't know Christ, that didn't know Christ, what hope is that? To lose your grandmother, your mother, and to not know Christ. I saw that just yesterday. <laughs> and this person, this young girl, is the other just crying out. And I wanted to go in and say, hey, she's in heaven. It's okay. If you live for Jesus, you'll see her someday. But how could, how, how could I say that? Well, Pastor, you can't judge. I don't want to lie either. I don't want to lie either. Because <laughs> I, I was tired. I wanted to go in and tell her a message of hope. I wanted to say, yeah, you lost your loved one, but hey, she is with the Lord. I can say with all assurance, and my friend, I can say to you, there's comfort in knowing there's hope. But if you don't know Jesus, what hope do you have? That's a reality. And I've seen also other services where a priest, pastor, We'll do, just go through, just read off the very thing that's written. They do the same one every time. Say the same things. Even the prayers at the graveside, open it up, read it, get their check, go home. I'm on the other side of the wall. I want to go in there, wait a minute, stop, let me say something. <laughs> To have religious rituals. There's no heart in it. And I've seen people leaving saying, well, that's nice. You said some nice things. The person said the same thing last week and the week before and the week before. Mm -hmm. Isn't that sad? Aren't you glad we're not here about rituals? We're here about relationship. Amen. And I can say, stand before you and say, me personally, and I kind of feel like you're with me, I know Jesus Christ. I know where I'm going. Amen. I am far from perfect, but I am purchased. 
And when my day comes, and if you come in my celebration of life, it's going to be victorious. I am, I'm, I, I'm going to rise from the dead. He is risen from the dead. I, I'm with him instantly. I, I, you can know where I'm at. You can know that. Do you know that? Can you, can you say, I know if my day comes, if we had an earthquake and my building fell on me, I'm with Jesus. Amen. Can you say that? You know how many people don't even have pastors today? They call the funeral home and they say, you got somebody? They don't have a spiritual leader. They don't have, they just want someone to say kind words. I've seen funerals from the VFW funerals to where there is no pastor. There's nothing spiritual. It's just a good old boy. And in the casket has a can of beer and cigarettes. Yeah. Lost our good old boy. Everyone leaves and where's the comfort in that? Where's the hope? Where's your hope? See, the Jews were basing it on what they, their heritage and, and the privilege and the pride of, I'm chosen. And I go through rituals and activities, but their hearts weren't even there. And people look at them and say, I don't want that. Do they want what's going on here? Do they want, do they see in us a relationship? Do they see in us a blessed assurance? That we know no matter what this world throws at us, no matter how difficult it is, that I have Jesus Christ and Him crucified, and because of His resurrection, I too will raise. I'm victorious, no matter what you're facing. Yes. What's the worst they can do to me? Kill me? <laughs> is that the worst you can do? Because I'm victorious. Are you? Think about it. Are you? Are you? Do you know Jesus? Oh, I'm religious. That's not what I'm saying. See, the term religion in and of itself is fine. It's when you put your salvation on religious activity that you're missing it. You're missing it. See, when you know Christ, he makes you alive. What do you mean? See, when Adam and Eve, when they embraced that apple, you've heard about it, kind of the one with the worm in it, only went all the way through. When they embraced that, they embraced sin. And their spirit died. Their spirit died. Oh, they were alive physically and emotionally, but they no longer, their spirit died. So when you come to know Christ, you say, I need a Savior. I need Jesus, the Lamb without blemish, only one. His name is Jesus. And I receive you. And it says you are born again. You know what that means? That means your spirit is reborn. Now you've come alive. And you're alive in him. You're alive from the inside out. Your core is healthy. All at once. Yeah. And you're beautiful from the inside out. See, there's a lot of people you'll meet in life that's much like that apple with the worm in it. Oh, they look good. But they're wormy inside. <laughs> Their core is rotten. What's your core like? What's your core like? God made us alive. And I love this. Verse 15 says in the scripture, and having disarmed the powers of and authorities. Jesus disarmed them. That means they had a hold on you. The principalities and powers of the air, they had you. My friend, you are in one of two kingdoms. You can't ride the fence. You're either a child of God or a child of Satan. You are one or two. Before you came to know Christ, you are of the kingdom of darkness. And the powers that be had a hold on you. Even blinded you. And Jesus removed those blinders. And you can see clearly what you, what's in store before you. 
You can also see your sin and your carnality. And you cry out to the Savior and say, save me. And he reborn, you're reborn and your core is made new. You're not the same anymore. You're not the same anymore. Christ disarmed, disarmed the principalities and powers of the air. He set you free. They no longer have power on you. Praise God. You've been free. Set free indeed. He made a public spectacle of them. Of them. How? He says, that's my child. I'm taking back what's rightfully mine. That's my child. That's my kids. That's my child. They come back. They were lost, but now they're found. Take your hands off of them. Thank you, Lord. Take your hands off of them. Right. The powers of darkness, you don't have them anymore. Right. They're mine. And he puts his seal, the guarantee of the Holy Spirit, in you. You're so much his that he says, I'm going to live within, within him. You are now the temple. Of the Holy Spirit. Think about that. You're his temple. He abides in you. See, we could cry out and say, I know the scripture says he'll never leave me nor forsake me. Praise God, he's always there. Oh, praise God. But he's always there. And I'm undone. Because I'm not living right. He says, I'll never leave you. Even when you're not living right. So what's that do to us? It brings conviction on our heart. Are we really going to tell God, well, I'm not living right and you just need to embrace it. You just need to accept it. You need to rewrite the whole Bible and make it like me. <laughs> or, you're God. I die to myself. I need to change to be more like you. Help me. Give me power. Authority. Let those lies quit coming in my brain. Set me free once again. He goes on to say, triumphing over them. How? By the cross. How did he kill, kill the darkness? in our lives by the cross he became a spectacle of himself and he took all that garbage that Satan thought he had you in he took it all on the cross he made a spectacle of himself <coughs> triumphing even over the darkness so that you might have My friend, don't take pride in your baptism. Don't take pride in your activity. Be humble in his presence. Say, I give everything to you. What a privilege to be in your presence. Thank you, Lord. John 15, 16 says, you did not choose me. I chose you. I chose you. He says, you're my child, and I'm taking you back. Get thee behind me, Satan. That's what he told Peter. Get behind me. You can't mess with me. Get behind me. He's mine. She's mine. If that doesn't change your life, I don't know what will. <clears throat> Triumph. My friend, I'm tired of Christians acting like they're defeated. You are not defeated. Amen. That's a lie from Satan. No, no, no. Quite the opposite, right? You are victorious. Yes. My word, the word of God says it. He triumphed in your life. You are now a winner. You are now his child. Yeah, sure, sometimes you fall. I mean, you raise children and, and your children aren't perfect because they're a lot like you. 
right? Why is it sometimes, I mean, that's a whole other parenting class. <laughs> we sometimes think we want them to be better than me. Bring them to Jesus. That's the best thing you can do. That's the best thing you can do. Bring them to the one that can truly change their life. So now their core is refreshed and pure. My friend, today, if you don't know Jesus, you are literally rotten to the core. Well, I'm a good person. No. You're rotten. I am too. I'm a good person. Really? Want me to start going down some examples? When that person cuts you off on the highway, you say, praise the Lord. <laughs> or do you want to speed up and bump them? You're not a good person. And apart from Jesus, you're not going to make it. Because your core is rotten. Praise God. It's almost like you just gave you a visual. It's like Jesus has tweezers and he takes that worm and it's out. Not only that, but he heals it. It makes it pure and whole. So now life is refreshing. And now those worms, they're on the outside. They're not in your heart anymore. Because now you're pure in the core. Oh, don't take pride in your righteousness. Be humble before the Lord that made you pure and whole and right inside. You know, it really discourages. So last year we had 24 baptisms. 24. What really tears me up is how many of them didn't stay. I, I talked to them. Did they understand? I never want to baptize someone and say, well, because of your baptism, you now are saved. You can go and live with the devil. It's okay because you got baptized. No. No. Right. And it discourages me for the ones that didn't stay. Did they not understand? Did they not know Jesus? If you don't know Jesus, you just get wet. But if you know Jesus, you're dying to yourself. You're taking the cross and you're following him. Are you a follower of Jesus Christ? How's your core? How is your core? Do you look the part or are you a child? God. Think about it. Let's take a moment to pray. God, today if there's someone that know, they know they're not right with you. They know they're not right with you. And they've been playing the part. They've been playing games. But their core is not right. I pray today, God, by your spirit, that you would just reach out to them and say, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Take my yoke upon me. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. And you will find rest to your soul. See, you find rest when you know Jesus. And maybe today, God, there's someone here that they know Jesus, their core is right, but they've let some worms in their life. They've let them in. And they know it's not right. God, today I pray that you would not, for you did not give us a spirit of condemnation, there is no condemnation for those that are Christ Jesus. But there sure is conviction. God, if there's one today that have done that, I pray, Lord, that you would set them free. That you would set them free indeed. However you're moving in our hearts, God, <clears throat> I pray that we look at our hearts. Are we right with you? How's it?
Let's just wait just a minute. <laughs> we get in such a hurry. How's your core? God, let, let this church never be a church that plays games. God, touch us. Minister to us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. <coughs> Maybe there's someone today that it's just keep our heads bowed for just a moment, just a quick moment. That you're honest, you're, let's just be honest, that you know your core is not right with the Lord, it's not. And you, you need that blessed assurance. If that's you today, would you quickly just raise your hand?